Hey, Adam Mills here with Royal LePage, and I'd like to welcome you to What's the Deal? Today, I'm very honored to be talking with the rogue lawyer, Philip Miller, about why realtors suck. Now, I cringe a little bit inside when I say that, but I think it's going to be a great, a great, uh, great talk that we're going to, you know, unpack here together. So to set the stage, um, you know, with the, the way things are progressing through technology, access to info, um, you know, more people these days feel that the modern day real estate agents have really just gotten lazy. Um, you know, while everyone has their own opinions of our industry, it's really up to you, the consumers, to separate the good from the bad. So how we do that? Well, I'm hoping that's where Philip's going to come in here and try and save the day for us. You know, Philip says if a realtor wants to earn their commission, they should be doing a lot more than just adding your listing to MLS or posting about you on social media or hosting open houses. You need to look to work with someone who's going to provide as much value as possible to that transaction. They're going to step up their game. And I think the biggest thing here is really have, you know, have you know, your best interests at, at heart for them. Um, so, you know, Philip, I'd love to dive into this with you and figure out, you know, how do we, how do we figure out, you know, what realtors are good to work with, which ones suck and, and really get us, you know, a better sense of the, the industry here. All right. Well, let's get right into it. And just so your listeners know, I have done similar, uh, events titled why lawyers suck because I think <laughs> I probably more hated than realtors in many ways, but I think in order uh, to win the trust of clients, like you have to be honest about your profession, honest about the good, the bad, and not just try to kind of con people into hiring you, whether you're a lawyer, a doctor, an accountant, or a realtor. So, uh, you know, I've been in the real estate world for a few decades. I've seen thousands of transactions. I've worked with hundreds and hundreds of realtors, and uh, I love to work with the great ones, and I love to work with great lawyers, and I think uh, we can do more to help people make more informed decisions because if you're hiring a lawyer, your life is on the line. But if you're hiring a realtor, you're selling the most valuable possession you probably ever own. And um, you want to make sure somebody's acting in your interest, not just pretending to act in your interest, but is more more concerned with commissions, let's say. Uh, and I, I think as a starting point, it might be interesting. You know, I've dealt with people who will go into a Starbucks or a grocery store and argue about you know a dollar 29 overcharge on the receipt but something psychologically happens to people when they're selling a house that yeah. they'll walk away from six thousand seven thousand dollars that are tax-free because they're so caught up in the emotions and you know one of the re what one of the criteria i cite for realtors who i trust are ones who are more concerned with giving you every dollar you can as opposed to just closing the deal so they can get the commission check because i'm sure you've talked about it with your people 100 i mean yeah. like i have that conversation with sellers all the time they're like oh you know what just, just we'll take it i'm like well hold on a second guys you're talking about you know twenty thousand dollars of tax-free money you know how, how much money do you have to earn in your salary to to recoup that that differential that you're just throwing away right now Mm -hmm. like let's take a pause let's talk through this and make sure you're making an informed decision and the best one for you you know like all i mean obviously we talk a lot of people through um you know the idea of, of, of making transactions but we also talk people out of transactions you know on a, on a regular enough basis if we really don't think it's in their best interest to carry forward uh with, with that purchase or with that sale i mean at the end of the day it's got to set them up for whatever their life goals are in one three five years whatever that might be uh, we want to make sure that we're working in that, you know, in that direction with them. That's what I say as a criteria is I've actually met very few realtors. who I know with hundred percent certainty will walk away from a deal losing commission if it's in the best interest of their client, but yeah. it's counterintuitive because I think too many realtors are short sighted. They need that check. Uh, they, they want that bonus money. But long term, it doesn't help their reputation. And so you build a reputation that becomes a legacy over decades by doing the right thing, by acting in your client's interests. Uh, and that's the way to be super successful as a realtor. But there's so many financial pressures and so many new people coming in every year that they're looking at it from a short term perspective, not on building a strong personal brand. No, 100 percent agree. And in our industry now, I mean, 2020. You know, the market started, you know, well, shut down with COVID, then opened back up and came back with a vengeance as we go mm -hmm. through 2020 into 2021. Um, and we've seen like in the auto market, you know, a massive spike in, in, in new realtors, you know, joining the market thinking, oh, wow, this is going to be an easy way to make money. Um, but now as soon as the market started to shift a little bit, we're starting to see those realtors, you know, begin to panic, wonder when their next sale might be, 
wondering if they're going to remain in the business. So yeah, I think more than ever right now, it's so important to align yourself with a realtor that's not distracted by, oh, you know, I need to, I need to sell a house this month so that I can pay for my own life. But work mm-hmm. with a realtor, again, who's going to have your best interest at heart, take care of you and set you up for the, you know, for the future you're trying to build for yourselves. Something you might consider, I did um, a little ebook like a decade ago on tips to hire a lawyer, because I find when you hire a lawyer, uh, I was in the military before I became a lawyer, and uh, like it's very hard to hire. You don't know what you're hiring. You don't know what you don't know. And, yeah. and so I wrote a book that gave tips on how to properly interview a lawyer, what to do. And I think from a realtor perspective, you could probably do something on here's five or 10 tips to hire a realtor. And, and one of the points that just popped in my mind, what you said is, you know, are, are they part time or full time? Yeah, because you're full time. You have to build a reputation that will sustain you over a decade. But a lot of people think it's a, it's an easy way to make quick money. They dabble in it. They want the check, but they don't want to do the. Um, I think from a realtor perspective, um, it might be useful to think of it. To get into law school is very hard. So everybody is trying to get into this little tiny door. Yeah. So they bust their butt, they work and they get in it. And then once you get in it, uh, you do your schooling and now you're kind of you can get you can make a decent living. But it takes about nine years of education and then you got it. So it takes about 10 years before you can make good money. Right. For realtors or insurance or other broker or other types of jobs, it, it's a wide open door to get in. Yeah. Right. And so it's a wide open door. Anybody can get in. But to be successful, you don't need a, a university degree, but you have to spend 10 years, almost the same amount of time working on relationships, working on building a brand, working on trust, knowing that market better than everywhere. And in 10 years, you can make the same amount as a lawyer. And so when people are looking at hiring a broker, I think they need to say, are you dabbling in this? Are you committed to this? What are your reviews like? Know if that person is truly committed because being a great realtor, I think you change the lives of people, but crappy realtors, you know, put people into houses they shouldn't be in. Uh, if I was you doing some posts, I would show I don't know how many people, especially first time buyers, get kind of screwed over yeah. by the realtors who kind of show the property. Well, you, know, you, don't about, like, you don't know what you don't know. And at that yeah. point, they don't know anything. Mm-hmm. But even like thinking you're a first time buyer, you, you're, you're, you get so excited about buying a house that that emotion can get in the way of a good decision. And so they know that the first house you'll be shown when somebody's taking you around is, is one that they know is horrible. Then, what, then they'll show you one that they know is way overpriced. And then they'll yeah. put you right in the one. You know, and it's just trying to kind of get that deal done quickly. Uh, You know, I think there's a lot of room and that's why I commend you for doing this on informing your people on how to how to be better consumers. Yeah. And one one thing, too, and I know we talked about this offline at one point, but, you know, a lot of realtors will try and get people handcuffed to contracts. Right. Because like, cool, I I have a buyer now. They're on a buyer representation agreement. I've got them, you know, committed to me. Now I can sit back and just wait. You know, Mm -hmm. that's, that's a lot of what these newer agents are inexperienced agents are, are doing. Um, and so our, like our team's philosophy. So for one, we don't hire agents that are part-time. Like you mentioned the part-time piece, we have a hard stop on that. We'll only bring agents onto our team that are full-time. They're all in, they're committed to the industry. Um, but then on top of that, you know, when we meet with a buyer, we'll walk them through a very professional buyer, you know, uh, package explains the whole process start to finish. We'll build their property search and then take them out on a round of showings, which we refer to as a test drive. And we say, you know what, let's, let, let me take you out and show you three to five houses in, in one evening. Let me, and then from there, let, let's see if we work well together and see if you think we're actually adding value to your experience or not. If you are great, we can look at, you know, solidifying a relationship together. And if not, we can part ways and say, you know what, no harm, no, you know, best of luck. So it's, it, it, you know, like I wouldn't buy a car without driving it. So why, why would I, you know, meet a realtor and before they show me a house, get emailed a, a contract to sign. Um, to work with them exclusively. It just doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, I had a mentor once say to me, um, when I, he goes, when people ask me how to get rich, the answer is slowly. But people are <laughs> so busy trying to make yeah. money fast, right? And so yeah. you do, you can get a used car salesperson approach to uh, home realtors, right? Where it's like dazzle, you know, if somebody shows up in a BMW and a Rolex and a big pinky ring, it doesn't mean they're necessarily working in your interest, right? But sometimes subconsciously that makes you think that you need them. Um, so it, really interesting. I was interested, how do you address uh, in Ontario the kind of dual agency 
issue that I think is is understated but always there, like in terms of double list, like double ending a property. Double ending, yeah. So and then so right now the way it's legislated, if there's a big brokerage and the brokerage could have 600 realtors in it, if there's a realtor working from that brokerage with a seller and another one working with a buyer, and they come together on an offer, that's multiple representation or, or dual agency, mm -hmm. right? So I run a team within a brokerage, let's say. It doesn't matter if it's an offer from a member of my team or an offer from an agent who lives 45 minutes here from here that I don't know. The same brokerage has both sides of the deal. We're in multiple rep. So, I mean, in that, in that circumstance, um, people have to treat people in a fair ethical manner, but they're not actively working for either client. I mean, that's the way we're legislated to do it. So what we typically do as a team, so I'm speaking now just for us, um, would be if I have a listing and an agent on my team gets a, a, a lead or a, a buyer off that they wants to come see it, we'll have them sign with that buyer and explain to them that we're going to treat them as a customer. So we'll have them sign a, a buyer customer service agreement, which solidifies we'll answer their questions as long as it doesn't you know, jeopardize the seller's best interest, but we're not actively working in the best interest of that buyer. So we make that very clear. Mm -hmm. So that way we can still stick with, <clears throat> you know, for our, our seller and, and our seller's best interest. Because that's really at the end of the day, I think the fairest way to navigate it um, outside of, just sending that buyer out to a, a completely outside outside brokerage. Because mm -hmm. I've bought and sold a lot of real estate over the years. And <clears throat> one of the strategies I used, and this is just what I've used, what I've seen happen in the market outside of, uh, of anything close to your scope is I would go to a listing where I know, I, I know the listing agent and I would just approach them independently uh, without an agent. Because I yeah. know that they're gunning for the 4% or the 5% or whatever the number is, depending on the thing. And then I engage them in small talk, but because they're, you can sense the hunger to double end it, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. That I can, I can ask, I can get information I should never get. And the, yeah. and the seller doesn't know that the agent wants that, that double commission. And so I play with them and I, you know, I can get them to say that what the lowest number is. And yeah. then I know what their commission is. So then I can come in 1% lower than that and, and scoop a deal. I think, what do you think about, I think one way to resolve it maybe ethically is if you're if a deal is being double ended, give the buyer, you know, more of the percentage, like don't take as much because then you're not as incentivized to do it. Right. Like if somebody just comes in and like, there wasn't a lot of work necessarily you know, yeah. if somebody contacts yeah. you and then you assign them an agent in your own listing and then they're still paying the 4%, like, I think it would be a something that you could say is, hey, if we can do that, you know, we'll reduce your commission by a point or something like that to show that you're actually, what do you totally. think? Yeah. So a lot of times with sellers, when we're signing a contract, they'll have the question of like, hey, what if, you, what if your team generates, uh, you know, the uh, the buyer? And I mean, so we do a lot of work. I live out in the Mantic area, which is just kind of south of, of Ottawa. Um, and we're doing a lot more work in that neighborhood. And and we did, I brought a buyer to a listing that we had before it hit market. And so what we did in that circumstance is, yeah, we have a reduced fee structure for the seller. So the seller benefits from it, um, you know, because we're bringing a, a buyer to the table uh, of our own. Um, the one thing that's really important though, from a, a paperwork and like, just like a legislature perspective, perspective for us is that in a multiple offer. So if another agent had an offer and I had an offer and we came to, mm -hmm. you know, at the same time, I can't give a discount. Yeah. Now, technically speaking, based on Rico, we can offer a discount, but we have to tell everyone what yeah. discount it is. Um, I find that looks awful. Optics on it are terrible. I feel like a yeah. like a slime ball doing it. So I tell sellers, and it's in our contract, it's written that here's your discount if we double end it, but there's no discounts in multiple offers whatsoever. And uh, it just makes for a level playing field. Other agents that bring buyers to our properties go, wow, you know what? That's a fair way to treat it. We appreciate yeah. you doing that. Um, other, yeah, other, otherwise I, I feel like you're, you're not, you're not doing the right thing. That's ethical and a cool way of doing it. And I think the good agents will respect that. And then you'll develop relationships with other good agents. Cause I'm sure you could, uh, yeah. And they, and they like bringing buyers to our properties because like, oh, we like dealing with Adam and his team. Like they're, you know, they're, they're above board. They're good people, you know, easy to, to work through a, a transaction mm -hmm. with. Um, well, that's what customers don't see is with in lawyers too like one of the things i didn't i didn't like about lawyers when i got into the profession was you know sometimes they'd have two angry clients and they get them both angry but then when the clients left they'd kind of clink glasses because they know that their anger means that they're going to do more billables right? right but the clients never see it right. just like clients who hire realtors don't see kind of the chicanery that can go 
behind the scenes for somebody who has a bad reputation with other realtors, but is yeah. presenting themselves perfectly to the clients. And the clients don't know that they're not getting as good a deal because other realtors won't work with them. And that's why the interviewing process is so important, I think. Oh, a hundred percent. The interviewing process, I, I encourage people that, I mean, a lot of our business, like we're 88% of our business this year is from our database. So repeat referrals. So we're very high in that, in that regard. I still, when I meet with people who I've worked with in the past, I'll ask them, I'll say, are you interviewing someone else? If they say, oh no, we worked with you before. I'm like, I'll tell them like, well, why, why don't you call someone? Call one other person just so you feel good about your decision. Do your due diligence and, and you'll just do a, a check on me to make sure, you know, I have, I'm not dropping the ball here and giving you the wrong info. Because um, at the end of the day, I think you should. I think you should always get more than one opinion on no matter what you're doing. Yeah, that's a sign of a, of a secure and powerful person because, a, you know, a cheese dog who needs that is, who needs that lead is, you know, won't tell you to do that. But somebody who's comfortable right. that they have a, a book of business and referrals like I have no problem if I tell somebody to interview three lawyers because first of all, I want them to go with the person that they connect with the most, right? I don't want yeah. a, a client who doesn't resonate with me to hire me and similar with you, but by, by inviting them to go somewhere else, it, sometimes it almost encourages them to hire you faster because they're like, oh my God, yeah. finally I found somebody who, who yeah. seems like I can trust them. Yeah. How are no, you finding new realtors or where are you getting realtors who have the kind of character that you want in your business? It's tough. Um, and, and as the market shifted, there's more and more people who are saying, oh, you know what? I'm not making money on my own. I want to join a team. Um, so we get a steady enough stream of people looking to kind of join the team and, and, and work with us. Um, we're very, very slow at hiring. Um, you know, we really make people through and the agents on our team can speak to it. It's, it's an awful process to go through if you want to, you know, apply and, and kind of get hired by our team. Um, you know, we have there's three different interviews you have to jump through. Uh, the third one being a role play, which is, is cringe, you know, it's cringing to do that. Uh, but we have, you know, the panel of the team set up and then we have the person coming in and they either, you know, pretend that they're working with a buyer or pretend they're working with a seller and uh, and have to do a, a role play presentation to us. And and that's one that I would say the majority of agents that are, are applying will will bail on the process when they hear about that. They'll say, oh, you know what? No, it's OK. And they'll, and they'll tap out because they just don't want to go through it. You know, they're, they're looking for the magic bullet to sell real estate that to make things easy and fast. Um, and it just doesn't exist. There's no magic bullet. It's, it's hard work. Uh, you know, it's being professional. It's just, and it's just doing a good job for your, for your clients. That's, it's interesting. That reminds like when I was in the military, I worked with some special forces units and the way that you say team is it resonates with me because a lot of the realtors, lawyers, people who want to be in the special forces, they think that being special is about the I, like how important I am, how good I am. So when you tell a realtor that you want to see them role play to see if they can actually support a client and they say no, they take themselves too seriously. They would be they'd be failed out of any military course. And you're, you're absolutely right not to take them. But the person who who focuses on we and on the team will yeah. gladly participate in that to show you how they can capture what you need. And then that those people build a team. And that's probably very powerful for your business to have a team of people who all buy into the group above the individual. hundred percent. Yeah. It's, it's all about the team concept. And we try and do events with our team as well to do some team building, um, you know, just again, to, to make our relationship as a, as a unit stronger, like we're, we're doing, and you've probably heard of escape rooms before, but we're, we're taking the whole team out to do an escape room. and then going to go for dinner afterwards. And again, it's just mm -hmm. making our, our team stronger so that we have mm -hmm. better synergy because ultimately we might be, you know, having more than one team member work, work with a single client. We might have, you know, Melanie on the team working on the buying side with someone who's purchasing, but then I'll be working with that same person when they're selling, mm -hmm. right? So Melanie and I have to be really in sync with each other. And I think doing these kinds of exercises make sure that, again, the, the experience for, uh, mm -hmm. for our clients is top notch because as a team behind the scenes, we're, you know, we're very much in sync with one another. And that, that's what is missing, I think, from a lot of people want to make money is the concept of trust. Like, you know, your clients have to trust you and your teammates have to trust you that you're not going to like try to step over them to get ahead. You're not going to steal their deals. And once you get in that environment of trust, it's a fun place to work. We haven't done an escape room, but a company that I'm involved when in, we just did a tough mutter on the weekend. Nice. Okay. I'll yeah. tell you if you get a chance, take your team there because uh, I won't mention her name, but there was a blonde lady in our team there, who, you know, big nails, the whole thing. And uh, she was all worried about breaking a nail and. And she was all, 
but then once we got once she got her face planted in the dirt all of a sudden turned into a very tough uh a tough mutter yeah so that's amazing was, uh, but then you could see that when you did it um another one of the team members who you may or may not know was like we're not in the army philip we're not in the army but yeah you could see how when you start off people want to like run ahead and show that they're fit it's good nature but it takes a while to build people who understand you know we're all crossing the finish line together That's or right. not at all and yeah. uh, that tough mutter if you could bring your team out to that it's it was a spectacular event oh, that's awesome challenging. yeah that sounds that sounds really good that'd be that'd be a blast with you Oh, my, I, I phone, my phone is blowing up with those people texting me right now. Oh, yeah, they're, they're, <laughs> they're all like, hey, leave my name out of this. <laughs> I, I had a question for you. Um, mm -hmm. Like as an organization, obviously, you know, to, to, to give back the community is a, is, is a big one. Um, is there stuff that like that you guys do and that also that you might see other realtors potentially doing that you think is, hey, you know, this is this is a sign of a good business to have people giving back to their community? Yeah, the concept of charity to me is interesting because virtue signaling has really been something that I I resent. You know, most anything worth doing usually involves sacrifice. And I, I find there's a lot of people that are just quick to kind of put a ribbon on and say they're doing something in order to get business. The number yeah. one way that I get business or I think anybody should get business is by focusing on the customer, not yeah. by kind of putting on the ribbon of the day you know, and trying to, sometimes I find like people will leverage other people's suffering to show that they're a good person. You're a good person by how you treat people. So, you know, we do some um, charity events. Often we, we keep it a little bit on the QT. Yeah. Right. Uh, and, um, but like in, I think regionally, locally, you find something that matters in your community, right? And it doesn't have totally. to be something, uh, the things that are most impressive is when I meet somebody and all of a sudden I hear that, oh, for three years you've been doing this, but you've never really posted about it or bragged about it. You know, the organization has just been doing it. Now, sometimes you can use social media to raise more money. Yeah. So if you have a cause that like you have a client whose child has leukemia and you just put them into a special house, right? You could do an event that raised money for leukemia. Like that would be cool. Yeah. But uh, there's just a lot of virtue signaling out of there. Uh, yeah, I, the I agree. With you. And so, one way we can do it at our law firm is we'll take pro bono cases. So we make money on good cases, yeah. but we'll, we'll take some cases for free because it, they're just, it's, it's in the interest of justice to do it. Right. And I'm sure you, um, you know, because once you become good, like you're a, a leader in your field, it's, it's hard for people to access the best people because you have to pay for that generally. Yeah. Right. So it, it's nice every once in a while to go and help out, um, help out somebody who can't generally get access to somebody like you or. Yeah, no, that's, that, that's interesting. I mean, from the real estate side, I've, I've never really heard much of that in terms of, you know, if a realtor taking on a, a listing or, or, you know, mm -hmm. to help someone out in that sense and do it pro bono. Um, mm -hmm. That's an interesting one though. I like, I like that. I think, you know, with the market shifting the way it is, there might be some people who are, end up, you know, really in a jam that, um, you know, there could be an opportunity for something along those lines. Mm -hmm. that's interesting mm -hmm. see i know that, i know that you hear that that the terminology in, the, in the, the legal world quite a bit yeah it, it could be a charity that's selling something you can waive the fees you know there, yeah. you know if um you know the dream homes you know if there's a sale there you can dedicate the commission you know to the charity there, there, yeah. i think there's some ways to do it i i've been more committed these days to trying to help young people who don't have strong role models yeah. Uh, you know, and doing a big brother type of thing or a big sister type of thing. I think those organizations, it, it's hard to get volunteers because everybody is terrified of allegations that are poor. But there are so many people in neighbor, so many young kids who don't have good male and female strong role models. It'd be nice to, uh, you know, Tough Mudder is uh, you have to be 14 to do it. Okay. You know, an interesting thing to do would be to get your team together. And then have each member of your team sponsor somebody kind of from a disadvantaged community to do the Tough Mudder with you who's over 14. I mean, yeah. Wouldn't that be kind of cool? Because they yeah. would never see anything like that. Nobody even takes them to a baseball game, let alone show yeah. them how you have to work together to get over obstacles. That could be an interesting thing to do. Yeah, no, 100%. Um, do you have any real not... horror stories? Yeah, I was going to yeah. yeah. ask you actually a similar question, right, in terms of horror stories that, that pop up. Um, you know, like on the real estate side, I mean, like what, you must see a lot of things like deals not closing or, or just mm -hmm. 
you know, deals have gone completely sideways and it might be, you know, a realtor not necessarily papering a, a transaction properly or not setting the right expectations for people. Oh, we've had some litigations where they forged deals and then brought them to the person and try to convince them to take it. Like, and, you know, obviously you don't want to hire those realtors. You can also, people can also look up realtors, like always Google your realtor's name. Google, yeah. You want know, to see if they've been involved in a, an investigation or anything, do a little bit of research. Yeah, uh, like on, on Rico, way, you can see, I guess, eh, if yeah. they have any, any investigations against them. Mm -hmm. But what I, one thing I'd like to see more, I, I'm, I'm encouraging it in my law firms, but in realtors, I, I would like the idea of getting courses that other people don't have. Like there's a lot of kind of rah, rah, Grand Cardone stuff out there. Yeah. Right. I think I was talking about you, but there's an awesome hostage negotiation course down in, in the States. Uh, I can't remember his name. He writes a, wrote a book called Never Split the Difference. I think you've, you've read it. Yeah. But you can go, you know, you could offer, you know, your top realtors uh, based on, you know, supporting the team, not necessarily numbers, a ticket to go and take that course. Because I think what realtors, a skill set that's not defined or developed enough is negotiation. Right. As you said, getting that last $5,000 in your client's pocket and that that's a really it's a high end skill set. I think too much emphasis is front ended on getting the listing, being kind of a salesperson, but not on the kind of poker play to right. get the best deal. So there, I think there's some some of those skill sets and that it would make your team feel special because you're like treating them like a special forces unit where they get these courses that no other realtor has. Like I like that idea. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a, uh, that's a, that's a good, really good idea. Um, and you should think that you, course, Chris Voss, you would love that course. Like, it, and you get people from all walks of life down there and then you do mock negotiations uh, in business and hostage. It's very cool. Oh, that's wild. Yeah. Okay. No, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll look for it for sure. Um, and yeah, like horror stories wise on our side, I mean, geez, we hear, we hear all kinds of stuff that comes through that, you know, and we'll take over listings uh, or have a buyer come to us. I was working with another realtor that just, that tells us like, you know, here's what was happening. It didn't work out. We, you know, we want to interview your team and, and work with you. And like the stuff that you hear people say that, you know, has taken place is just, it's mind blowing what, what's going on out there. And it's again, you, I mean, this is super cheesy, but we tell and our motto and, you know, internally for us is treat every client like they're your mom. You know, if you, if, you know, if you wouldn't suggest this advice to your mom, then you shouldn't be giving it to anyone. Right. And if you do that, it's a super easy barometer for people to say, you know, am I telling them the right thing? Just treat yeah. everyone like your mom and you'll, you'll be fine. You know, like it's, it's going to work yeah. out. I think people also need to um, select a real estate lawyer with a little bit more uh, attention as well, because there's a lot of old ones out there uh, who still think yellow paper and a wax seal is the way to do things. <laughs> like we're in a digital age and, yeah. you know, and they'll make their clients drive across the city, wait two hours, sign a hundred pieces of paper in the digital world, in the digital age, you know, we can close a deal anywhere in Ontario through zoom. Right. right? Person doesn't have to pay for parking, do driving. And, you know, and, and in the old days they opened up the files, people, it's a problem. People go to a real estate lawyer only after the deal is firm. Yeah most of the time but yeah. generally if you have somebody who knows what they're doing they they study contract law like it wouldn't be a bad idea to drop 500 extra dollars on a million dollar home to have them look at the deal you know and yeah. th that's where your relationships with lawyers are good too because you could even you could even suggest hey take a look at this, this is a big deal for you uh and, but the old days they opened it up like a week before close and just assumed they could get it done and then everybody's rushing to the bank with envelopes yeah. Today, real real estate lawyers should be opening up that file the second they get it, making sure the client knows what closing costs are going to be. Because a lot of your clients, if people are buying the most house they can, right, often they get surprised three days before they go to sign that they got to bring another six grand or four grand or 12 grand to close oh, yeah. the deal. And, you yeah. know, it just makes everybody upset because they didn't budget for it. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I, I mean, we send things like the second things are firm unless the, you know, the buyer wants us to send things for review ahead of time. Uh, the second is firm goes to the lawyer right away. And that could be 60, 90 days before, before closing. And you're right. Most times we start hearing communication from the lawyer could be two weeks before closing. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and sometimes the buyers are calling us saying, Hey, like, yeah, I know you sent the paperwork to the lawyer. I was on the email, they confirm receipt, but we haven't heard anything, you know, and it's like getting those, calls and those emails from, from clients is, mm -hmm. is frustrating. So I, I look at it and say, well, you know, the, the lawyer here should really be jumping on this and just, even if they schedule a meeting when they first get the paperwork, schedule a meeting for a month from now, that's fine. 
but get something in the book so the client thinks there's something coming up. You know what the problem though is, is and I'm not going to complain that lawyers don't get paid enough, but legal fees for real estate transactions haven't really gone up over the last 20 to 30 years. Yeah. And, you know, and the reality is 95% of the work is done by a clerk. So if you want that interview with a lawyer, like they're 300 to 600 bucks an hour for yeah. other work, right? right? So what happens is because there's been price pressure on legal fees, the lawyers don't want to do anything. They just want to, in order to make a bit of money on a, you know, 600 or $800 fee for a million dollar house, it's all got to be done by a clerk, you know, and you don't even see the lawyer sometimes. And yeah. so my philosophy was, okay, well, maybe you don't need to see the lawyer as much if you can do everything digitally. So what it should be is as soon as that deal comes in from your office, the client gets a very detailed email saying, these are the steps. This is what's going to happen here, here, and here. Yeah. You know, the law clerk is going to call you this two weeks out, one week out. And you know, then you can make money on a real estate deal from a legal perspective because it's automated. But it becomes a problem when you're still doing it in a prehistoric way, but the fees haven't gone up. So yeah, I think that's where well, I mean, I agree. I agree. it goes sideways. Yeah, that's why I deals agree. don't close. And that's why, you know, it's because of that, that price pressure, I think. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I mean, for the last 13 years, I've been, uh, you know, I've been, been a realtor. I haven't really seen legal, maybe they want it $50, but they really haven't shifted. Like the needle hasn't moved much on, mm -hmm. on, on what, you know, lawyers are charging. So that's why I think digitization can make that same fee structure profitable and actually probably do a better job because in the old days, anybody who's bought a house before you go and you sit down and then they bring out all this paperwork with little tabs on it. And yeah, you know, it's a signing festival. Nobody knows what they're signing and you're supposed to be grateful that there's a lawyer there. It's yeah, you know, to me, it bores me to death. So, you know, just as a little plug, if any of your Ottawa clients, we can service all Ontario digitally. If you ever want some of your clients to use like the most uh, up to date law firm. Yeah, you know what? It'd be, it'd be it'd be refreshing to have some some of that take place. Versus, I mean, like for us, when wherever we buy and sell, like my wife's a teacher, so mm -hmm. to set up a meeting, it can't be during school hours, Monday no. to Friday. She can't get time off, yeah. and then for us to drive into town to you know meet a lawyer. By the yeah. time we do that, they're closed. So oh, it's it's a ten to fifteen minute Zoom meeting. Yeah. to close the deal like think yeah. of it and so the lawyers want to be treated like they're royalty you come to them but from my, our perspective it's like no let the person stay in the comfort of their house not pay for parking get it done and then if things go sideways you have a litigation team that can actually have some teeth if somebody is screwing around with you right like that, right. that's what i would want from a real estate uh a real yeah estate. no it makes a lot of sense um, one thing I forgot to mention in the beginning, I mean, so for people who are watching us, we do have a lawyer here uh, able to answer questions. I know it's one of those things, you don't know, always have access to a lawyer. So, I mean, you do have access right now, guys. So if you have a question, um, it's free right now. If you know that the meter will start running later. So uh, certainly if you have questions, I, I would jump in with, with some. No charge. No charge for now, for now. <laughs> um, I'm just going to check my phone here quick. So I had one, um, and we can probably tag team this. I had one here on on social. So um, it says here, I, I might have already covered most of this, but how can I identify a good real estate agent before I agree to work with them? Was that was the question that that came through? You could, we, you mentioned it. You know, it's your own interview process. There are people who are natural salesmen who go into real estate. I, I don't think you have to be a salesman as much as somebody who facilitates a journey right like the sales thing is like that so if you're getting too much of a salesy pitch i think that's a red flag somebody yeah. who's who, who's putting pressure on you and being too glitzy you know you want you want somebody who will come see you in their house i think somebody who will open up to you ask them what matters most to them ask them about their most rewarding deal see if they get a little emotional talking about how they put this immigrant family into a house they didn't think they could afford and they were there the day with their kid in there like see if they actually feel anything because to yeah. me that's those are the people i want to work with and those people i know where there are just some people who are just kind of uh, you know saccharine but salesy you know i would ask those you know what's a deal you wished you walked away from looking back at your career where did you make a, a mistake when you were helping a client because if somebody yeah. is comfortable they can talk about their mistakes and tell people they learned from it but if somebody can't mention a mistake then they're not really self-aware or in tune with reality. That might be something that could help. The the one that for me, and like I don't want to, you know, 
smear my mistakes across this this live here but uh <laughs> one that comes to mind when you said that was uh it was one of my first ever multiple offers you know so i, I was setting it up saying you know, there's no offers until and this was i don't know it might be in, in, in 2014 something like that um and, and anyway so i set this up there's multiple offers and i set it for you know I, I figured in my mind I'm like i'm doing the open house sunday two to four let's do offers you know sunday at five o'clock it's gonna be great people are gonna be fired up they're gonna want to buy the house um anyways did it we got the one offer ended up selling the property but like upon further reflection learning what i know now a sunday after an open house is an awful time awful awful time for multiple offers because people who saw it you know if they loved it didn't have a chance to talk to their lender because they were closed to figure out if they can afford it so or afford more yeah exactly yeah. so they, they had no idea so i mean those people are like i love it but I don't know if I can participate. Well, we lost those people because I made that that choice to do offers Sunday at 5 p.m. So, I mean, I, I learned that one uh, and, and I'll never do it again. That but, would be a uh, great answer if I asked you that question. Like I'd be, very, <laughs> no, I just mean because it's authentic and to be able to share that because people, everybody's pretending not to make mistakes, but the best heart surgeon in Canada probably killed 20 people making right. mistakes, right? The best trial lawyer, like I lost trials years ago that I would win today. You can only become exceptional by putting yourself in a position where you can make a mistake and learn, right? Yeah. And then that makes you a great, that makes you a really good mentor, I imagine, to your team members, because as a leader, you have to be able to speak like that. And then you can share those lessons with young people so they don't have to make them. Exactly. But people who think that they don't need help from anybody, their, their shit doesn't stink, you know, they're not going to, they're not going to respond to that environment. So, that, you know, that, that was a, an impressive way to, to show self-awareness right there i think oh thank you well i got lots of i got lots of those if you want more <laughs> lots of fall on your face stories yeah, I got, them yeah. Too. Um, I got one more here um so this one here so should i use a realtor uh sorry should i use the lawyer my realtor suggests or use my own <clears throat> i guess it depends on the realtor right uh, what i don't like about the industry is there's a lot of kickbacks in the industry and you know i would never ever pay a realtor for sending me clients, right? There are a bunch of realtors who most of whom I think are good people send them to me because they know they're taken care of. But there is a lot of chicanery out there, even on the prices of legal fees. Sometimes they'll send you to somebody who looks cheaper, but they're going to up your bill by three or $400 in extra disbursements that the client doesn't even know what it is. And they're going to kick the realtor a hundred bucks. So, if it's a realtor you trust and he can and he or she can articulate why this is a good option, then I, I would take that seriously because they're a professional in the field. They've seen a lot of real estate lawyers, you know, and if and if they're an amazing person, it's very likely they're working with an amazing person because they're not going to work with somebody who's uh, who's a bag of, bag of crap. On the other hand, if you have a real if you have a lawyer that you like and you trust, right, and knows your personal circumstances, you know, I, I always tell people you know, speak to them before you have an emergency. So if you have a, a, a real a real estate lawyer you've used in the past, speak to them about what you plan on doing, ask for their advice, have a relationship. That money spent up front uh, is better than having a disaster later. The, uh, the one area of referrals that I don't like is people, this is probably more true in, well, I think it happens in, in, in the real estate world as well, is you use somebody because somebody you know knows somebody. Right. Right. So I tell my buddy, I'm going to sell my house. He goes, oh, my sister just became a realtor. And, and you do it because of that friendship. Yeah. But you're selling this giant asset. It shouldn't be based on friendship. It's like, or if somebody gets hurt in a car accident, they're like, oh, I got hurt. And they're like, oh, my, you know, my brother is a tax attorney. And they call them and then he sends it to somebody who gives them a kickback. Like, do your own research. Don't do it just because you know somebody. But I, you know, I respect good people's opinions so they have to be able to articulate why it's a good person to use not just that hey my brothers just got into it use them and i'm sure you see that a lot uh, a in lot it. yeah and the odd time like i I've, I've gone to interviews where i'll go in to meet someone uh for a listing i'll go through the whole thing and we always like everything that we go through with them like whether it be the the pricing analysis or our marketing strategy we leave it with them i say you know what mm -hmm. here's information i want to you know have it in your hands so that you guys want to remember what we've talked about Mm -hmm. You can review it, you know, later on yourselves and then make an informed decision. And I've gotten calls before and they say, you know, what, Adam, thanks so much for this. Um, you know, my nephew just got his license and uh, <laughs> we felt like with the information you provided that he would be able to do the job. 
<laughs> and, and and so my response to that is, you know what, if, 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 if your nephew needs help or has questions, you know, have them reach out to me. I'm really happy to, to give them my two cents, you know, all the best with your sale. But mm. that's happened to me and it's fine. I mean, you know what, like someone that, that their nephew's got to start somewhere. And if that's the way they're starting their, their, you know, their journey by getting that, you know, the foot in the door there, then, then good for them. I hope it works out. I wonder if you could do paid consults because um, I just <laughs> Love, you know, I know what you're Love saying, them. because when you have a free consult, there are always people value what they pay for. Yeah. Right. And uh, when you give a free con, there's people who come shopping and just try and get like information in the legal world and then go do it themselves or get somebody. Um, because the effort that you put into putting a listing together, really, people should pay for that. Like right. when you do your presentation, you're putting in hardcore work. You're an expert. Uh, I, I've never thought of it before other than in that context, but, it, but it's interesting that, but that, that also is a testament to your character that you just do the right thing. And if people want to be, you know, cheap about it and re- that's going to happen, but in the long run, you're going to be, you're going to benefit from, uh, from what you're doing there. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. I mean, I, I, and I would love to, you know, charge something for like a consult. It's just, it's so ingrained in people's minds in the industry that it's free to have a realtor come and give you a sense of what your home's worth. But you know why they should, the consumer should be more educated about that? Because you become susceptible to being um, fluffed up and it happens in law in some cases, in a personal injury case, where somebody will interview three lawyers and one lawyer will go, I'll get you 2 million bucks. Right. And if somebody comes to me, I'll say, I don't know what I'm going to get you. You know, but it might be this, this or this, but I'm not going to inflate the price to get them in and then try and force them to settle for a hundred grand later. That yeah. happens. Is it, that, I'm sure you've seen it, but that happens in the realtor world where somebody oh, will say, sorry. I can sell your house for this, knowing they're just going to reduce it. Yeah. And they end up selling it for less than the honest, honest person. But you I'm, can't know if you're getting honest information, if you're getting the information for free. So I, I agree with what you're saying. Um, like I, like I, we call it in our industry, like bought, you're buying a listing. So a realtor could go in and price out a house. And let's say the real number is a million dollars is what it's worth. Another agent comes in and goes, oh my God, it's the most beautiful house I've ever seen. I love it so much. We'll get you 1.5, you know, sign with me. It's going to be amazing. Mm. Right? So some sellers will be swayed by that and say, well, if this guy's giving me 1.5, that's great. I'll go with them. When I walk people through a pricing analysis, I say, here's all the comparables that are active on the market. Here's the sold ones in the last, you know, whatever, zero to 90 days. And then, and I have notes and I say, based on all of these, your house is worth in this range. And I'll, I'll make it very clear. Um, and I'll tell them, I'm like, if you're interviewing other agents, that's fine. I encourage it. But as they're presenting these numbers to you, maybe we'll, we'll be looking at similar comparables or different ones. I don't know. Put on your buyer hat and ask yourself, if I was buying my house today, based on the other data I'm looking at, what would I write myself a check for? It's a hard thing for a seller to do, but if you start to think of it from the buying side, it does help add clarity. And I've had sellers say, you know what? I went with you. Another agent told me to get me 300K more. But when I, I thought about it from a buyer perspective, I'd actually, I would never pay that for this house. It's not worth it. So it, it sometimes works. I mean, other times it doesn't because people get sidetracked. That's interesting. I wanted to say there's a couple of points there. That kind of comparison chart also could be manipulated, right? Yeah. And it, I, the parallels I'm finding kind of between law and, and realtors right now are interesting because in law, people always say, oh, this is a case, like there's a precedent, right? But you just see the final result, but you don't see the work that was done to get the results. So in law, for example, you can have a case that found X. And so everybody will go, oh, because it was X, everything should be X. But you don't know that the lawyer actually sucked. And right. that's why you got the case, right? Yeah. And so on your comparables, I think the interesting um, assessment is, you know, what would a good agent have got for that property versus kind of a bad agent who kind of had to fire sale it because they overpriced it, reduced it three times. Like, you know, it's hard, it's hard to let your clients know what the difference a good agent makes on pricing. Yeah. Right? And maybe it's you stay closer to the actual list price or whatever, but, you know, finding out what that kind of intangible is really interesting. Yeah, we track. So one metric we track a lot is the list price to sale price ratio. So how, mm-hmm. how good are you at staying close to your, to your list price as a, as a realtor? Mm-hmm. Um, and so we have every year we track how we did as a team and how we compare against the Ottawa Real Estate Board average just to see if we're always, I mean, our goal always is to outperform that average, uh, mm-hmm. which we have so far. Um, so that's always our goal. And that's just, you know, strong marketing, strong negotiating and, and pricing homes, right. Is how we, how we achieve that for people. You know, um, would be an interesting exercise. I'm just spitballing with you, but 
if you took your prospective client's listing and then just changed it a little bit so it was unrecognizable and then created 10 listing sheets, you know, and, and try and get them to say which one would they buy at this price. And yeah. they, they might pass by their own one. Right. <laughs> because they've taken the emotional lens away, but then that gets them grounded in reality. Like it might be, you know, there might be something interesting you could do there. Yeah, it's kind of, yeah, it's a, yeah, I see what you're saying with that. It's kind of like a, like a psychology experiment almost. With them. Yeah, because they're seeing it through, oh my God, I love my fireplace. But other people are saying, okay, I've got 10 listings. I've got this amount of money. You know, where should, where should I place my, place yeah. my house? Yeah. Yeah, no, I like that. That's a good idea. Um, time wise, do you have time for one more question? One more question, brother. Okay. Um, I did have one more here that came through. I think it was on Instagram. Um, there we go. So, okay. So this one here is um, first time home buyer should, oh, sorry. No, that was a lawyer one. Should I, no, sorry. Yeah. Sure. Should I go to my realtor or my lawyer for questions about closing? Um, <clears throat> you know, the, 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 the kind of staple answer is it depends, right? If you have a, if you have a pretty new realtor, right. Who's not part of a strong team, you know, I wouldn't go to them because I, you know, I wouldn't be a hundred percent confident. They're going to give me the advice that's in my interest because they want the closing to happen. Right. Yeah. The law firms don't really depend on that, that small fee as much as a realtor will. Right. I think in the best case they should collaborate and you would, I would ask both people the questions, right? The realtor is working hard for you based on the commission. So I would always get work out of them. I would always put it in an email. Don't do it on the phone, put it on an email so that your answer comes back in writing because people yeah. put more thought into writing and you can, you can kind of track it. So I would put the question to the realtor and then I, you know, ideally I would personally call the lawyer and ask the lawyer as well. Yeah. Right? Uh, you know, and the law clerks are great sources of information because they do thousands of deals. But you want to speak to a lawyer when it's you have a million bucks on the line or half a million dollars on the line. But, you know, for somebody like you who's done all of these deals, you know, most of the you know, most of the answers. And the best thing about you that I can tell is that, you know, when you don't know. Exactly. Right? So you would tell somebody, hey, that's a great freaking question. This is what I think is the case. But you should have a relationship where you could pick up the phone and call me on behalf of your client. Yeah. And say, look, I've got a deal coming up here. We're doing this. What do you think? Right. And then, you know, because if you're sending deals to a lawyer and they're making money off your referrals, you should have cell phone access to those lawyers to help you when you have contract issues. Right. That's yeah. how it should work. Uh, and then if they need a consult, then they can go there. But yeah, no, I totally, totally agree with you. And, and yeah, I mean, a lot of like this, when we get those questions, if they're simple ones that don't impact the closing timeline, Mm -hmm. uh, like the, the more logistics in nature, then yeah, I'll, I'll stick handle those. No problem. People mm -hmm. go, Oh, you know what? My, my lender just said that I might need a couple of days extension. Can you, can you work on that? My answer is I could do an amendment to extend the closing if the other party agrees, but I will not entertain anything to do with this until we engage your lawyer to make sure that the mm -hmm. lawyer is the one driving this process. Because again, if things go sideways, I want to make sure that the lawyer was involved at the beginning of it. Um, because it could be, you know, a legal action afterwards. And I don't want to say, oh, well, I did an amendment, just thought it'd be nice. No, if, if I'm doing anything to, to derail a closing or adjust timelines, I'm, I'm looping the lawyer in to say, here's a situation. Let me know how you'd like to proceed. And if you want me to do an amendment, no problem. Just give me the direction to do so. That's where I think the team concept works too in the financing, yeah. the legal and the realtor. If, you, if you're working together, you can provide more to the client than just being individuals. Yeah, no, 100%. Well, this was, uh, this was great. I, like, thanks so, so much for your time. I know we went a little bit over there, so hopefully you're not going to send me too big of a bill for that one. Um, no, brother. I know you're <laughs> going to send some deals our way at some point anyhow. So I think we'll that's be it. Uh, but but no, I, really it. I got to know you a bit better. And certainly if I'm in Ottawa, I know there's nowhere else I'd go to buy my house there. I have a bunch of military friends there uh, who are still serving. So I'll, I'll give them your name if they're looking for anything. That's amazing. No, I really, really appreciate it. And, uh, and it was a fun, this is a fun topic to tackle. I was getting a lot of backlash when I was posting on social that we're going to do a, uh, you know, like a video on. About hey, let let me just speak to those realtors who are giving you backlash. <laughs> Fuck off. <laughs> Seriously. Right. If you're, if you're a fragile, you're not good and you have to be able to like, to be real to your clients and to each other. So I, I commend you on, on, uh, on everything you're doing. It sounds amazing. I look forward to talking to you again, bud. 
Likewise. All right. Well, thank you again. I really appreciate it. See you later. Sorry for the F-bombs. <laughs> no. See you. Bye-bye.